we have a special guest here today to talk about the Pistons offense. We're going to dive into are some of the shots that they're getting on offense actually good quality looks. Are they getting enough threes up, enough open threes up? We're going to talk about all that and whether Cade is going to help fix these problems in today's episode of the Lockdown Pistons podcast. <laughs> Are Locked On Pistons, your daily Detroit Pistons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's the deal, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast. I want to thank you guys again for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. I am your host, Kuka Hill. You can find me over on Twitter at Kuka Hill. You can also find us over on YouTube at Locked On Pistons. Make sure you guys have, if you guys haven't already checked out the channel, you guys go check it out, subscribe at the bottom. We're trying to reach a thousand subscribers. Right now we're only at around 300. So everyone, even if you don't want to watch it on YouTube, just go support the channel, support the podcast, support the network by going over to YouTube and hitting that subscribe button down below. And also make sure you go down below if you listen to this on Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. Uh, but coming up on today's episode of the Locked On Pistons podcast, we're going to continue a conversation that we've had throughout this week. Uh, dove into some more stats. We're going to continue to talk about the Pistons offense because their defense right now is ranked 10th in the NBA in defensive rating. So I think their defense uh, is pretty good right now. Uh, but right now, offense has been absolutely terrible, and we're going to continue dissecting what's wrong with the offense. And I thought that we should definitely bring someone on who does some film breakdowns himself and likes going into film and diving into all the stats like that, just like myself. You guys know him very well. He's an active guest on the Lockdown Pistons podcast. We got Bryce Simon from Motor City Hoops on the podcast. Bryce, how are you doing today? I'm good, Koo, man. I appreciate you having me on. I'm excited to talk, uh, as always, the Pistons and, and what's going wrong offensively and anything else we can get into. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and just dive right into it then. Also, actually, for those of you guys who are not watching on YouTube, uh, you guys can find Bryce over at Motor City Hoops on Twitter, at Motor City Hoops. Make sure you guys go check him out, follow him. He's doing a great job film breaking down everything from Detroit Bad Boys, but also on his own podcast and on Twitter. Uh, you guys know Bryce has been coming on the podcast for a while. He's a great follow. He knows the game. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy our episodes, but make sure you guys go check him out on, on Twitter and support his podcast as well if you haven't already. But um, let's go ahead and dive straight into it, Bryce. So I talked about on last podcast, and you saw the clip I tweeted out, uh, the little short clip from last podcast that I said about the Pistons offense and how, you know, there's things you can pick out about any NBA coach. Dwayne Casey certainly has his negatives. He certainly has some of his shortcomings. I won't be afraid to call those out. I think everyone who uh, follows the podcast, follows me over the last few years, knows that I am not afraid to call out Dwayne Casey if I feel like he needs to be called out about something he's doing wrong. However, in the last podcast, I said the Pistons are getting up around 15 open threes, uh, wide open threes, which is identified by NBA.com as six plus feet from the nearest defender on open threes. They're getting up 15 of those. And they're shooting 22% on these attempts. I said, you know, you can say the offense maybe is a little stagnant. You can have your criticisms about how Dwayne Casey's working the offense. But overall, if your team's shooting 15 wide open threes and you're shooting 22% on them, there's not much a coach can do about that. He's getting you 15 wide open threes. You're not hitting them at all. And it's that that's on the players. That's not on Dwayne Casey. Before we dive even more into it, we brought some more stats into it and some more deep diving that I've done. Uh, but before we get into any of that, just give me your overall thoughts on that. Do you do you agree with that? I, I also brought up that, you know, there's a difference, and we talked about this a little bit before the, we actually start recording, is that there's a difference between getting open looks for Hamadou Diallo and getting open looks for Sadiq Bey. The defense is giving you open looks for Hamadou Diallo. They're not giving you open looks for Sadiq Bey. So do you feel like that, you know, from watching and all the film breakdowns you've been doing, do you feel like the Pistons are actually generating good open threes? Or do you feel like that's, you know, the defense is giving you these open threes from these certain players and still – you know, the offense is kind of stagnant. It does kind of still fall back on Dwayne Casey. No, I mean, I'm kind of like you. I think there's definitely things with Dwayne Casey that I don't want to say I call out, but I've questioned the Killian Hayes fourth quarter stuff, the rotations and staggering of minutes, which I'd like to see more, and the isolation offense that we've seen a little bit too much of, which maybe we'll talk about a little bit later. But, yeah, if you just look at the percentages and coaches don't shoot the ball, Sadiq Bay shooting 24% from three right now. Kelly Olenek, 18%. Frank Jackson, 15%. And even Corey Joseph, who shot it relatively well for the Pistons last year, is at 13%. Hamadou Diallo hasn't hit one, and he was almost at 40% with the Pistons last year. So we're not talking about, you know, Josh Jackson needing to be a 40% three-point shooter 
or even Isaiah Stewart making shots at that clip. So I, I do think it's the, the right guys are getting shots. Sadiq Bey finally made a few last game. I think we'll can see him continue to make shots and shoot it better. I think Frank has been forcing it um, here in the early in the season, taking some that he probably shouldn't be. And so I think he'll come back to that. And Kelly Olynyk, that's a guy we talked about all offseason coup that was a good three-point shooter. He's taken some tough ones, but he's also got some good looks that he's missed. So I think we're going to see a little bit of, you know, regression back to or progression, I guess, back to the mean of us being a, at least a, not the worst NBA three-point shooting team in the league. You know, even if we're bottom third, maybe not the worst. Yeah, so I, I, let's go ahead and dive into some more stats and bring these up to the surface and we can keep talking about it. So the Pistons currently are in the bottom three of three-point attempts simply gotten up. And we know that Dwayne Casey has mentioned multiple times that three-point shooting is something he, he wants the team to get up. He wants them to get shots from beyond the arc up. Uh, you know, it's part of the new NBA. You need to get some threes up. You need to space the floor. Um, so when I talked about the Pistons having 15 wide open threes a game, which is how many they shoot a game from six plus feet, the nearest defender, um, I didn't think about, or honestly, if you want me to keep it a stack, I didn't know that you could sort that out on NBA.com amongst the entire league. But I learned that today. So I went, you know, let's go ahead and see, is that really, the are the Pistons really creating a lot of open threes for their team? Or is that still relatively towards the bottom of the league? Um, so I went and pulled it up, Bryce. Um, and before we even do that, I actually just want to ask you a fun question real quick. Who do you think generates the most open threes in the NBA? Through three three games, um, Utah Jazz. All right, so Utah is currently the second worst. They only create 11 open threes a game. Really? Yes. They shoot 45% on them, but they only shoot 11 of them. They only generate... Uh, six or uh, 11 wide open threes so they're who just lead, better at making tough shots okay yeah so who leads the nba right now currently in wide open threes is the boston celtics at 24.8 wide open threes a game they're getting 25 they're getting 25 wide open threes per game they're shooting 36 percent on these uh so it's pretty good i would say it's pretty damn good um then right after them actually is the orlando magic at 21.3 they're shooting 34 percent though uh but anyways let's get Let's get back into it. I just thought that would be pretty fun. Uh, Bryce, off the do off the dome, off the top of your head, where do you think the Pistons rank in generating wide open threes? I mean, just uh, I'll be honest, if I hadn't seen some of the tweets and comments like what Dwayne Casey said about how the offense has created open shots, I would have said one of the worst in the league. But based off what we've seen over the last couple of days, I'm going to say at least the top half. So I'm going to say number 12. All right, so the Pistons right now are currently in the bottom 10 in generating wide open threes. They're 20th in the NBA. But the thing is, and, you know, it's it's hard because th there's two things I want to say about it. So, obviously, they're not generating that many wide open threes if you look at it across the NBA. So, actually, they're not creating that much. However, that's just about half of the three-point attempts. They're only getting 29 threes up. So, still, it's like – it, the thing is, I think the the bigger problem here, and you let me know if you agree with this, and we can carry on this discussion into the second segment. Okay, I think this is a pretty big topic to talk about. Um, but do you think that you know that they're generating good open looks, and it, it's more about simply just needing to get more threes up in general, or do you feel like that the offense is not playing that well and it's not really structured that well right now, so they're not really actually getting that open threes or the offense is even setting up to generate more three point attempts in general as well. Um, I mean, I think the offense has to be like that stat is, is what it is. So if, I mean, to me, that still sounds like a lot. And if over half of their threes are what we would consider wide open, I feel like we're taking good shots. And so I said this in the Killian Hayes article that I did just a couple days ago for Detroit bad boys. Whether people like this or not, the game of basketball is a make or miss game. At the end of the day, that's just, it, it is what it is, whether people want to believe that or not. And it comes down to sometimes you miss wide open shots and sometimes you make really tough shots. And through three games, the Pistons just aren't what it sounds like from the stats. I, I wouldn't have said this from the eye test. I'll be completely honest. And I don't dive into the stats quite as much. I wouldn't have said they were getting this many wide open shots, but the stats are what they are. So that's almost 50% of the three point attempts are wide open shots. I don't know how you can critique the coach or the offense or anything else for generating that many open looks. That seems like 
God's plenty to me. So I've, I'm hard pressed to really critique the offense or say that we need to change something drastically to get more open threes. Now, you know, I'm all about shooting threes. So if they want to shoot 10 more <laughs> per game, um, not at, not at this rate, not at this clip, um, but whenever they start falling and Cade, who may be our best shooter when he's back, then I think we're going to see that percentage slowly rise. All right, so we'll continue this discussion. And also, like Bryce added at the end there, we're also going to talk about will Kate Cunningham help this? Will the offense look better with Kate? Or is it possible that the offense that they're currently running may hurt Kate and help make and, and possibly make Kate struggle a little bit out the gate? We'll talk about that in the second segment. But first, before we get into that, let me tell you about a few of our sponsors. First up, Rock Auto. If you have a new part for your car, head to the store, go through a ton of confusing questioning just for one of the workers to tell you that they don't have the part that you're looking for. I know I have. That's why you should avoid all these problems and rock with another one of our sponsors, rockauto.com. Find whatever part you're looking for on your computer or in your hand on your phone by using rockauto.com. Don't worry about having to create an account or making a membership. Just head over to rockauto.com and start shopping. Rockauto.com always offers the lowest and most reliable prices. Head over to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Make sure you write locked on in your how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection. Reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. Then let me tell you about another one of our sponsors, BetOnline AG. Betting is now legal in Michigan, and BetOnline and all the sports are back and better than ever. A new web interface for the start of the basketball season and more props, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. Head to our new and updated desktop and mobile site, to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit, just use our promo code Locked On to receive your bonus. From basketball, football, baseball's postseason, the World Series currently going on right now, NHL, boxing, and even UFC, right to your favorite casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. BetOnline, where the game starts. All right, Bryce, so let's go ahead and talk about uh, continue this conversation a little bit more. So you kind of brought up Kay Cunningham. Do you think that Cade, Cade's return is going to be the fix all to all the Pistons issues? Like some Pistons fans believe, uh, you know, just simply inserting Cade Cunningham into the lineup will solve a ton of their isolation issues, their closing issues, their outside shooting issues, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think he's that much that poss possibly that big of an impact player to where he could solve all those issues when he returns to the lineup? No, he's not going to solve all those issues. He's not going to solve them. Is he going to make them better? Yes, because I do think Kate is a closer. I, I believe wholeheartedly we win game one season opener against the Bulls at home if Kate Cunningham's playing. I believe that. And I rewatched that game today, actually, and I still believe. I thought we may have should have won that game without Kate Cunningham. So I think, I think him being there, figuring out the closing lineup, I think we win that game. So he does help with that, but he doesn't solve all of it. He is a good shooter. I think he's going to shoot at a high clip in the NBA. So obviously that's going to help there. Um, the isolation issues, I, I don't know. And I don't know that it's an issue. It's just been more than what I thought. I've, to I've told you, we've talked about this. I, I want to see us play through the mid post. I think that's good stuff for Jeremy Grant. I think it's good stuff for Sadiq Bey. And I think it's going to be good for Kate Cunningham. I guess where my gripe would be, Koo, is I it's like throw it to them and everybody go stand on the weak side. Like, I guess I envision throw it to them, have a split action, cutter down the lane, a weak side flare, a weak side drift, a, a weak side stagger while all that stuff is going on. And that's not necessarily what we've seen. And so that would be my gripe with the whenever I talk about too much isolation. So uh, first, before we get into the isolation talk, let's talk about I'm going to talk about Kate Cunningham real quick. I think I agree with Bryce. He's not going to solve everybody's issues. He's not going to solve all the Pistons issues. I think right now the Pistons biggest issue is obviously offensively, but the, their shooters need to make shots. The ones who are shooters need to be able to hit these shots. Like you mentioned earlier in the podcast, Bryce, Kelly Olenek struggling from beyond the arc. Sadiq Bey struggling behind the arc. Frank Jackson struggling from everywhere on the floor right now. It's it, it, And then I brought this up in the last podcast. This is an, I, I think this is kind of floating underneath the radar a little bit because because of all the other shoot the actual shooters who are missing and, and playing that bad from beyond the arc, I think it's kind of floating under the radar. But right now through three games, Isaiah Stewart's only got off one three. He's not even popping anymore. Um, is that like a big deal to talk about right now? Probably not. But I think that's something you need to watch moving forward because one of the big reasons about putting Isaiah Stewart in the starting lineup was behind the fact that, you know, he showed progression as a three-point shooter quicker than you thought and that you thought he was going to potentially be a spot – or not a spot up. Let me not say that. A big who could possibly hit the three when he needs to. 
And he has he, it went from in the first game, he was popping every now and then. He wasn't taking the shot, but he would at least pop off the screens. To I believe in the last two games, we've just simply simply seen him stop popping. He I don't know if I if he's popped much at all in the last few games. And he's only got one three up. So I think the Pippen's biggest issue, obviously, is just they need their shooters to shoot better. And they need, I think they possibly probably need Isaiah Stewart to start popping a little bit more and trying to spread the offense out and continue to get these threes up. Uh, not just for the team, but for his own development. You want to see Isaiah Stewart start to take more threes. That was one of the things we were looking forward to doing or looking forward from him this season for the Pistons. So that's the first thing I want to say. But Cade will help in that department. He'll hit his shots, I believe. He'll hit his open threes. He'll hit catch and shoot threes. He's a really good shooter. I also agree with you. I brought this up in the last podcast. I think the Pistons may have won the first game against Chicago if they had Kay Cunningham because of how close it was. And I also agree with you that they had a chance to win it even without him, obviously. But, you know, I think Jeremy Grant kind of felt himself a little bit too much in the closing moments of the Chicago game. Um, and turnovers definitely hit the – really destroyed the Pistons. Um, but, yeah, I think they possibly could have won with Cade. I think Cade's going to help a lot of their issues. Do I think he's going to solve them? Absolutely not. He needs his teammates to perform better. Uh, but I, I definitely think that Kay Cunningham – the funny thing is, is that while I don't think he's going to solve all their issues, literally everything he's good at is what they need right now. I think that's going to be a massive plus to the squad right now because they desperately need someone who can close. They desperately need someone who can be able to hit outside shots. And since they've been isoing, like me, like like I've said, I haven't. I, I feel like they've been isoing a little bit too much. Cade should be able to do a, a little bit better job in isolation right out the gate than most, probably almost anybody on the squad right now. I think Cade will have struggles in isolation because he's a little small right now. And he's a rookie, obviously. But I think even then, he still probably is the Pistons' best isolation player on the squad right now. So I think he'll help help in all these departments. And he won't solve them. He still needs his teammates. But I definitely think his addition is going to help them tremendously. And they really can't wait to get him back, possibly on the 30th, which we've been told uh, for the last few weeks. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to say real quick about that? Yeah, just two two things real quick. I'll make one quick point, and then I have a question. But – you brought up the defense, and I think, what you say, they're number 10 in the league in defense? Is that what you said? Number 10 in defensive rating. I think they're even better defensively, Koo, because whenever you don't score the ball the way the Pistons aren't scoring the ball right now, and you turn it over at the rate they're turning it over right now, that puts a lot of pressure on your defense. Watch that Hawks game, even the, the Bulls game on opening night. They play really good defense. They play really good defense. And I know the other team eventually gets in a flow, but when you're not making shots, your energy level, your enthusiasm, all that stuff starts to deflate. And eventually you're going to start giving up buckets on the defensive end. And when the offense started going a little bit in the second and third quarters against the Hawks, then the Hawks had figured it out offensively. So I think the defense could get even better. I'm not saying like best in the league, but I think we could see an even better defense when we start making shots because of energy that it'll bring. And then real quick, even with all this talk about the poor three-point shooting, have you noticed spacing issues for this team? Because that was my big thing last year was we needed three-point shooting because the lane was clogged. I'll say, I'll just answer real quick, my breakdowns of Killian and I started on a Josh Jackson one, I haven't noticed it as much yet. So I would be interested if you've noticed spacing issues even with the poor shooting. No, I ha I, I'll be honest. I don't think I've noticed it either. I think Kelly Olynyk, when he's on the floor, even if he's not hitting his shots, he's obviously drawing spacing. And I really, I talked about this on the last podcast as well. In the last Pistons game, I feel like all five of the starters played pretty well. And then it was basically the bench who really struggled. And that lineup of Killian, Sadiq, Josh, Kelly Olenek, and Isaiah Stewart, I feel like they had decent enough spacing and, you know, they could have hit more shots. I think they actually did a better job this last game of hitting shots. Kelly Olenek shot two of five, Sadiq shot three of eight. So I think that's closer to what they should expect. Um, but, yeah, I, I definitely feel like the spacing has been there. They need to hit the open shots. I think that's the biggest issue, obviously. They're just not hitting open shots and it's hurting them. Um, but we're going to go to the break real quick, but I want to talk about what you just brought up uh, at the end of the podcast. We're going to answer some of the questions you guys have sent in that you guys wanted to answer. I know I said I would answer questions today, make it a mailbag podcast, but I'll be honest, I didn't get too many questions and there's a lot of other things I want to talk about. So we're going to squeeze in your guys' questions at the end of the podcast. But before we get into that, let me tell you about some of our sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the Pistons defense and talk about a point that Bryce brought up. I want to kind of back that up with a little stats that I, that I found. Uh, but first, let me tell you about some of our sponsors. First up, Postmates. Do you smell that? It's the chicken parm, my favorite. It smells so good, I can't wait to eat it. But the best part, that showed up at my door because I ordered with Postmates. With Postmates, I get all my favorite food from the local restaurants in my neighborhood delivered. 
no leaving the house, and even better, no getting in the car or finding a parking spot. Postmates isn't all just burritos and sushi either. I can order things like toothpaste or phone chargers on demand too. That's because places like Walgreens and 7-Eleven are also on Postmates. My favorite part, when the app lets me know that my food or items have been delivered. Everything is right outside my door. So cool, that never gets old. Just download Postmates on iOS or Android, find your favorite foods or that one thing that you forgot to get from the store when you went grocery shopping and get it delivered on demand. And for a limited time, Postmates is giving our listeners a little something. New customers will get 50% off their first five orders of 50 plus or more when you use code Locked on NBA. That's code Locked on NBA to get 50% off your first five orders of $50 or more. Max savings of $100 per order. Just download the Postmates app, sign up online. It's super easy. Offer is subject to change and taxes and freeze apply. Offer valid for 30 days after you add the promo code to your account. Make sure you go check out Postmates and download it to your iOS or Android device. Then let me tell you about another one of our sponsors, Sweatblock. There are some things in life you just don't really want to talk about. You know, issues in relationship, family problems, or more importantly, sweating through your shirt for no reason when I'm in public with the boys. Yes, you heard me. Everyone has been there. I have. I know you guys have too. Simply wearing deodorant doesn't help either, but using sweat block antiperspirant wipes can help. Sweat block is doctor created and doctor recommended. You simply apply it at night before bedtime, go to bed. The next day you wake up and do your normal routines like nothing ever happened, except this time without the worry of sweating through your shirt. Sweat block works up to seven days per use and has a dry shirt guarantee. If sweat block doesn't keep you dry, you get your money back. If you or someone you know is dealing with the worst issue in life of sweating through their t-shirt when out in public, tell them about sweat block. Get it today for 20% off at sweatblock.com with promo code locked on or Amazon and CBS. Get sweat block now and stop sweating. All right, Bryce, let's go ahead and talk about one of the points that you brought up at the end about the Pistons defense real quick. Um, I just want to back up your point and get your thoughts on it real quick. So actually, as of right now, the Pistons are actually ninth right now, uh, after some of the games that happened last night. Uh, they're ninth in the NBA in defensive rating. Um, and this is, I think what you're saying about the defense could possibly even be even better is absolutely true uh, because the Pistons have a, the ninth ranked defense according to defensive rating, and that is with them turning the ball over the fourth most times in the entire NBA. So turnovers lead to easy buckets. Turnovers lead to transition opportunities for the for their opponent team, the opposing team. And then also another point that I want to get your – or not really get your thoughts on, but just add on to your point um, is, you know, when you're not hitting threes, when you're – actually the craziest thing about that, I just saw this stat. I have to say this real quick. You know how many threes the Pistons are making a game? This is actually ridiculous. Uh, six point six six. You actually directly correct. How how did you know that? How, did you I was, have it on? I, I was looking at the stats before we started recording. I just saw that they had made twenty, and then I, I'm pretty good at math. All right, so here we go. We have Mister Mister Mathematician <laughs> over here. Uh, but yeah, they <laughs> that's how many threes they're making per game. That's that's almost three less attempts than second worst. That's Cleveland. That's that's awful. Uh, but anyways, my point is, is that when you're also turning the ball over and you're shooting threes and missing a ton of threes, threes lead to long rebounds, with also was which also leads to transition attempts for the opposing team. So those two things, once those two things get better. You can assume the defense will also get better because a lot of the points are probably coming from that as well. Bryce, do you feel like that's an accurate thing to say are you, when you're breaking down film? Do you feel like that's causing a lot of the points the Pistons are creating or opponents are creating versus the Pistons off turnovers and long rebounds from threes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And like you say, that's that's long long threes lead to those long runouts. Um, anytime we take a bad shot and then obviously the turnovers. And so I think as the offense gets better, it's going to make the defense get better. And Again, it's like a momentum thing. Like you go down, you get a wide open three, you brick it, and it turns into a layup on the other end. And it's like, you know, that that hurts your momentum. So the next time you go to play defense, maybe you don't have a, the same amount of juice or focus or whatever it is. And so I just – I think I think it's going to continue to get better and better. I think Cade will help the defense as well. He's a high IQ guy. And I just want to say, like, you talked about the spacing with that starting lineup, and I agree. I thought it was the second unit that let the team down – um, in game three against the Hawks, if you look at their plus minus, which I don't always buy into that stat, but as a group, you can kind of buy into it a little bit. It wasn't very good, but you're talking about a starting lineup with good spacing that had Killian Hayes, supposedly not a good shooter, Josh Jackson, supposedly not a good shooter and two bigs on the floor in Kelly Olynyk and Isaiah Stewart. And we still aren't talking about like, Oh my gosh, how is this going to work offensively? I think that's encouraging. I know we keep saying it, 
when the shots start to go, this can look pretty good. It's just right now the shots aren't going at like a all time bad rate. And I just don't think it's a trend that's going to continue. Yeah, I also think some of the things that helped the starting lineup was the fact that Killing was able to hit two threes and he looked much more comfortable and aggressive. So that I think that helped him a ton, uh, especially with some of the spacing issues. They were leaving Cade uh, or not Cade, Killian open and Killing was able to hit two of them. So uh, I think that helped him a lot as well. One thing before we get into the questions, I just want to bring this up as well because one of you guys brought this to my attention. Uh, I want to bring this up. Bryce, where do you think the Pistons rank right now in the NBA in isolation possessions? Oh. See, the problem is I haven't watched enough other NBA games this year. I'm so fixated on the Pistons. I just barely catch some of the other stuff. I'm going to say not very high. Like, as much as I complain about it, my guess is it's in the bottom 10, in the bottom third. Okay, you are 100% right. They're actually in the bottom five. If you're looking at Synergy, they rank 26th in the NBA in isolation attempts. Um, so the thing is, let's bring this up real quick. Uh, this is this is the this is what I this is what I want to say about it. I feel like, and I'm almost 100 percent sure about this. I, I want I want I'm just gonna say that I said that to you, whoever it was that uh, tweeted at me or commented in the YouTube video uh, about this. I'm almost 100 percent sure that the little handoffs that turn into like an isolation that like you know it's supposed to be a set thing, but they back it up and then uh, Jeremy Grant's up isoing whatever, trying to do his own thing, or even off pick and rolls as well when you get switched. I'm almost 100% sure that those don't get counted towards isolation. It gets counted towards a handoff or gets counted towards a, uh, a pick and roll uh, possession with synergy. So I think maybe, maybe I'll change the, my, my, my term, the way I'm calling it, from isolation to simply being stagnant in offense, people standing around and the, the ball stop moving and guys trying to go one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe I should change it to that because it's not, it's not coming up as isolation possessions, though I think it should. Uh, in my opinion. But yeah, I think I would just start calling the offense really stagnant at times and a lot of guys standing around. Would you agree with that, Bryce? Yeah, I would agree with that. And I don't think we have a team full of guys that are good in those situations. I think we have a team that I, I think has high basketball IQ offensively, can do multiple things, play multiple positions. And I guess I want to see more of like a free flowing offense, like a motion, like DHO right into another DHO, into a ball screen, into reverse, reverse, attack the hard close out, you know, that type of stuff. And I just don't feel like we see those just beautiful. The reason I answered Utah Jazz earlier to your question is watching him in the playoffs last year. I was like, this is beautiful basketball, man. Like yeah. the ball's always moving, shot fake, one, two dribble, kick, one more pass, knock down. You know, like that that's the basketball I love. And so I guess that's why I assume that they were a team that would rank high in that stat. I think – I would like to see the piss, even if even if it's more ball screen, like start every possession with a ball screen with Killian going to his left hand. I don't care. But then it's kick out, dribble handoff, reverse, reverse, follow, DHO. I don't know. Like that's what I'd like to see more of. That's just me. Maybe that's what I find aesthetically pleasing, though. Okay. So good insight there. But we're going to transition now into some mailback questions. We're going to answer a few of them. We're not going to answer all of them. I'm going to pick the ones I think are most interesting right now. Um, so Bryce, let's, I'll, I'll ask for your answer first and I'll answer. So this one's from Arthur. He says, how many games do you think it will take before it's apparent that Kay Cunningham is the best player on the Pistons? Um, I don't know that Cade's going to be the best player this year. Okay. I think Jeremy's still probably going to hold that mantle for this season. All right. So I'm going to go with around 20 games. I think after around 20 games, I think Cade may, is probably going to be the best player on the team. My worry is, is that I've seen, from what I've seen from Jeremy, and it's only three games, but what I've seen from Jeremy is that so, I, I've, I've seen too much of what I saw towards the end of last year when he started breaking down a little bit and slowing down, is that the offense was all being put on him and he was being asked to do a little bit more than he was. Like he was scoring 20, what was it, 24 points a game like the first half of the season, but that was when he still had other guys to take attention off him and like Derrick Rose, Blake Griffin, even though Blake wasn't that good, he still drawed attention. So technically, Jeremy wasn't really the number one. Once he became number one, he struggled a little bit. And I'm starting to see that a little bit in the first game. Or actually, he only played two games, I think. Yeah, uh, he said third the elbow infection. Yeah, and he's also dealing with that. We, he's questioning. By the way, he did not practice last night. He's questionable for today's game. Um, but yeah, I, in the first two games, I'm starting to see a little bit more of that he sells for these long twos. Uh, basically, just overall, I think Cade is so well rounded on offense and will help this team so much that I think his presence is going to be felt immediately. And then maybe even if he's not like maybe if, even if he's not technically like their best player, 
I think a lot of fans are going to view him as their best player really quickly because he's going to close a lot of games, I feel like. He's going to play well down the stretch, and he's going to create a lot of good looks for the team. So maybe his overall impact may not be where Jeremy is, maybe not on defense as well, or maybe not as efficient out the gate. I think I think Cade is going to eventually take over as the best player on the team. Yeah, what I guess my hold up right now is I'm just interested to see how Cade's going to hold up defensively. I think he's going to be good, but I'm not positive. And how well he rebounds, which is an area where I'd like to see Jeremy Grant get better also. But I know Jeremy Grant's going to guard people. You know, he's averaged over 20 points a game in the league. And I think he's going to actually score at a higher and more efficient rate when Cade returns. So I think because of Cade almost, Jeremy might be able to shine more and still hold that mantle for one year. But make no mistake about it, Cade Cunningham is – I'm not trying to say that Cade's not the face of the franchise and won't be the best player on this team starting next year for the next 15. I just don't know as a rookie if he comes in as the best player. He may very well, but I guess I'm going to roll with Jeremy Grant at, at least for the rest of this season. All right, so let's go ahead and pull up the next question. Next question. I actually answered this question in the last podcast. Um, and I know I saw you tweet an answer to this, but I think it would be a good question or a good answer for you to kind of answer on the podcast and hear for everyone listening to hear your answer and what you think about it. So this first, this one was from Tila, the Pistons. It says, what's your theory on how a player like Killian can actually develop confidence? Seems more complex than just getting a pat on the shoulder or making some buckets. If Killian's confidence aggressiveness is at the core of the Pistons plan for success, how do they actually grow that? I gave my answer on the last podcast, Bryce. I know you said that on Twitter that you don't know if you really have a great answer for it. Um, just give us, do you, do you have any kind of sort of idea about it or is it really just, it, it's it's different with each player and it's, it's tough to really analyze. Yeah, and that's what I, I answered Tila and I hope, like I was being completely serious whenever I said like, it's a great question. And if I had an answer, I wouldn't be coaching where I'm coaching right now at a, at a small <laughs> school because it's it's one of those things I haven't been able to crack as a coach. I've been at it a long time. And I said in my tweet, like as a player, I struggled with confidence. I, you know, we've talked about this, you know, my shooting, whatever. Like if we just go to the gym right now, I could be the best shooter in the gym. I have a no doubt, but you turn the lights on and in a game and if you miss a few and stuff like that, like my the best players in the world, even some of the best players in college basketball, some of my best teammates and I didn't play high level division one basketball had un conscious confidence it didn't matter like I watched my teammate go 0 for 18 at George Washington and drop 30 the very next game if I went 0 for 18 I may never shoot in a game again like I, <laughs> like I I would have been so embarrassed my confidence would have been so shook and that dude still thought he was the best player on the floor when he walked on to the next game so there's I don't know how you coach it up I don't have an answer I don't know how you do it I mean, these guys in the NBA, I'm sure they have all sorts of other resources and experiences to do it. But to answer the question, I know that's a long-winded answer to say, I don't know. All right, fair enough. I gave my answer in the last podcast. Make sure you guys go check out the last podcast if you guys want my full answer. But basically, mine was, you know, as a player, someone who played basketball their whole lives, not as a high enough level as Bryce. But, you know, I dealt with confidence issues every now and then as well. And for me, it was more – you know, a coach can give you a pat on the back and be like, keep going, keep going, keep going. But anyone can really do that. You kind of have to reaffirm that, at least for me, it helped. When like a guy, like my coach, for example, he would tell me, you know, keep going, keep shooting. You're, you're, I know you can, you're struggling now, but keep playing your game. And then he would go after in like a practice or something and say it out loud in front of my teammates how he, he would publicly have my back and let me know that like, okay, I know for a fact that like if I keep going, he's going to have my back. I um, mean, so that public kind of, Re reaffirmation kind of like helped me a lot. It, it, it gave me a lot of confidence that even when I'm struggling, I know that he's laid out that he's going to have my back and he's laid out to my teammates that they're going to, they need to have my back as well. So that kind of helped me. It's kind of different with each player. In my opinion, you don't know, you have to know how to attack each player's psyche. And it, 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 it is very tough. It's tough. That's why you see a lot of players don't really correct that in their, in their careers. It's, it's, it's tough. So, uh, but this is the last question I'll ask and a quick question because we're running a little bit over. Uh, real quick, Bryce, I had this question in the in YouTube comments. It was, there's people that say Cade won't want to play off ball in the future. Do you believe that that could be the case one day? No, I, I don't I don't think so. I think Cade is an all-around team player, do what's best for the team, and is an all-around player in terms of, I think he can play on or off the ball. The more I've seen him, the less I've gotten worried about him needing to be the quote-unquote primary ball handler or only ball handler or always have the ball in his hands. 
I've actually gotten less concerned with that than I was whenever we got the, you know, when we won the lottery and knew we'd have a chance at Cade. So I have zero concerns. I mean, you don't never want to put the ball in his hands as the primary ball handler, but the way he shoots it, man, and being able to attack close out and get advantageous situations off the ball, I don't think he'll have a problem. And I think he'll be very successful in that role. So I completely agree with Bryce, but I'll tease this for a future episode. Bryce, I'm going to have to have you back on, and we're going to have to talk about what Cade Cunningham, what makes him great. I feel like a lot of Pistons fans don't seem to grasp why he was in a one pick and why he's going to be great. It's not because he's great. He needs to have the ball in his hands for a 35% usage rate. The part that makes him so great, and we'll dive into this on in a future episode for real. I really want to talk about it, but it's the fact that he's able to do a lot of great things on the ball but he's also lethal off ball too. That's part that's what made him good. The fact you can, you should use him in both areas too much of one area. Well, you're wasting him. If you're using him in both areas, the right amount, then you're getting that complete great player. That's going to be the best player in the NBA or not NBA. Let me just say that. <laughs> Take that back. I meant we hopefully, NBA. <laughs> one day, one day, one day. Yeah. Well, I meant to say in the NBA draft, but if he turns out to be the best player in the NBA, obviously Pistons will win a couple championships, but, but that's not what I meant. I meant, the best player in this draft class that he was drafted in. Uh, but yeah, that's all we've got for today's episode. I thank you guys for listening to today's episode. Thank you for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. I appreciate it. We are free and available on all your platforms as well on YouTube. If you haven't checked us out already over there, make sure for your second listen today, you go check out Lockdown Fantasy Basketball with Josh Floyd. The host is doing a great job talking about all fantasy basketball tips. I lost last week. I'm losing this week. I'll be sure to tune into the podcast to try to get some tips on how to work my team a little bit better because I can't go 0-2. I'm losing the fancy – I'm losing my fancy football leagues. Can't can't lose can't lose the basketball league too, even though the one I'm in with Bryce in fantasy football is going pretty well. That's all I'll say. But uh, <laughs> thank you guys for listening to today's podcast. Make sure you guys go check out Bryce for your third listen for today. Make sure you go check out Bryce's podcast, Motor City Hoops. You go follow him on Twitter, at Motor City Hoops. He does a great job. Make sure you guys go check out his work at Detroit Bad Boys. Really, he's great at what he does. Uh, he wouldn't be on the. I wouldn't be having him on the podcast all the time if I didn't think he was he was great at what he does. So make sure you guys go check out everything he does. I appreciate you guys wa- uh, listening today and watching today. If you watch it on YouTube, make sure you subscribe down below. Make sure you guys leave a five star review down below if you listen to this on Apple Podcasts. And until the next podcast, I will see you guys later. Peace out, everybody, and have a great day.